Is anybody thankful for Jesus today? Isn't he good? I just love what we get to do as a church each and every week. And I can just, I was sitting there as we're singing about the name of Jesus, thinking about how God looks down on his people as we sing songs to him, about him, for him. And that's what this series is about, songs of Jesus that we're in right now. We're talking about the Psalms. We're spending our summer in the book of Psalms, but that's what those songs were. They were songs that Jesus knew, that Jesus quoted, but I cannot imagine what heaven sounds like. If this sounds as good as it does here with voices like mine, can I get an amen? And yours, can I get an amen? How great it's going to sound when we are together with Jesus one day. But here we sit. Here we are. We live in the right now. And so let me ask you a question. We just sang this song about how the praise of Jesus will ever be on our lips. It's easy to sing it on a Sunday morning. It's a lot harder to live it on Monday afternoon. Am I right? It's easy to sing it as we sit in a church building, but it's hard to be the church when life strikes, when the here and the now gets difficult and gets challenging. And so today, that's what I want us to look at in the second week of Songs of Jesus. I want us to simply dig into how we can see Jesus in the middle of life, even when it gets difficult. If you've got your Bible, look at Psalm 3 with me. Psalm 3, the third psalm. And so we're going to continue building on this idea about how the songs of Jesus are impactful and powerful in our life today. And so let's look, and I want to talk to you about sleeping like a, like a baby. How many of you slept good last night? How many of you didn't sleep so good last night? You could use a little bit of sleep, some sleeping like a baby moments in your life. Let me ask you something. If, are you in the middle of something right now? If you are, slip your hand up. Say, I'm in the middle of something right now. I'm just dealing with stuff. Life gets difficult sometimes, and I'm dealing with some hard things. All right, you can put your hands down. Well, if that's you, then this message is for you today. So many times we go through life, and we can sing well on Sunday, and we're excited on Sunday, but we go home, and there are broken relationships. And David wrote this psalm that we're looking at today. And as we look at this psalm that David wrote, he was going through broken relationships. His own son, think about this with me, his own son, Absalom. It's the one that was born by Bathsheba, that relationship that was also broken. I like the lights sometimes. <laughs> just so you know, I can preach just as good with lights, without lights, it's all good. <laughs> and you know what? Even if the mics don't work, my mouth's really big too. Jessica will tell you that. So, so get your Bibles out and know that in Psalm 3, we're going to be looking at how David's relationships were broken, but here's what I know about you. Not, maybe it's not just your relationships that are broken. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you're in a transitional season. You're seeking what's next. Maybe you're looking at whether or not you should stay in the situation that you're in. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you can't find the right spouse. You've been looking. You're in a good place. A lot of good-looking guys and gals in this place. But maybe you can't find the right relationships, and maybe your kids have gone astray. Maybe you raised them up in the Lord, but you're struggling because they seem to just be wandering off the path. Maybe you find yourself off the path. Maybe you are finding pressure at work, pressure at home. Maybe you've run into financial hardships. Why do I share all these things? It's because I was making a list this week of all the things that really haven't gone that well for a lot of people in our church body, even over the last week. And everything that I just said to you, I've talked with someone or heard of someone directly that ran into those things and then some. You could probably add to the list, though, couldn't you? You've got your own thing that you could tack on to the end of that list. Maybe it's within faith right now. Maybe you've gotten a bad diagnosis. I sat at Parkview just this last week with someone who had just been diagnosed with cancer. And you know who you are, and so if you're watching today, she's not been able to be here, but maybe you're watching today, and I hope today's even an encouragement to you, and maybe it will be to you. So let me ask you this. Do you ever lose sleep over tough times? You feel like that's a trick question in church because I'm supposed to say no, because if I love Jesus, I should never lose sleep, right? But the reality is you lose sleep sometimes in life because of situations, because of problems, because the here and the now gets so difficult in your life. And so you know what I want to tell you about David is he understood what it meant to lose sleep 
David understood what it meant to go through the trials of life, probably in a way that you or I won't ever be able to fully grasp. King David, that's who wrote this psalm. When he wrote it, his son was after him. He was on the run because his own son was trying to kill him. You thought you had broken relationships. You probably felt like you could join Absalom sometimes with other people in your family. Can I get an amen? I'm not supposed to say that in church, am I? But it's true. But David knew... David knew what it was like to journey through tough times. And so that's what I want to look at today. I want to read something to you. You don't have to turn there with me. But in 2 Samuel, just so I can show you what David was going through, this is where uh, we find David running away from his own son. I want to read it to you. And it was during that time while David fled from his son where his own kingdom, his own people, this is a conqueror of nations. He's slain Goliath. He's slain nation after nation, but he's on the run from his own son. That's when he writes Psalm 3. But to get there, I want to read two verses to you out of 2 Samuel 15. Anybody ready for the word today? I'm just excited about what God has for you because I know it's going to change your life. So in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14, it says, Then David said to all of his servants, now put this in context. This is, yes, it's that David, King David, the killer of hundreds and thousands, the conqueror of nations. David said to his servants who were with him in Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. You skip on further. His own son was trying to take over the kingdom. His own son was trying to take over that which his father had given to him and brought him into. Verse 30, but David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives. Who were here when we were talking about olives? Anyway, just so you know, that's all throughout Scripture. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to some past messages. Sometimes we got to get crushed like an olive to get the pure oil of the gospel, the pure oil of the presence of God in our lives. No extra charge for that one. He went up there weeping as he went, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. So much for that powerful King David. Probably one of, if not the lowest moment lowest season of David's life that he found himself in. What I want to tell you about, I always try to give you a bottom line. This is what I see in Psalm 3. The bottom line of the day is really this. The best way to rest in God's promises is to trust him in the process. Who's got a process today? Like David. You're in the middle of a process You raised your hand a minute ago. You have one of those broken relationships you added to that list that I gave you. But at this stage of David's life, I think you can identify with him because he had learned to trust God during processes that didn't make sense. You ever been in a spot where it just didn't make sense? You can't make logical sense, rational sense out of the process that you find yourself in. How many of you would say, hey, I've been in processes I didn't ask for? I didn't ask for this process. You know, I often say, don't pray for patience or God will give you an opportunity to be patient. You say, well, I didn't pray for a process, but God has given me. He's allowed me to walk through this process. Well, David knew what that's like. Think about this. In this stage of David's life, he's a conqueror. He's a king. He's conquered all. You think about how powerful he's become. But at this stage of his life, he's also learned to find peace. And he's seen the peace of God become present during the processes of pain and of problems in his own life. And no doubt you find yourself there today. And so a good litmus test, a good test for you to know whether you found the same peace and live in the same peace as David would be the answer to this question that you might give. And that is, can you sleep at night? And I know sometimes we have sleep problems and disorders, but let me ask it a different way. Can you rest well at night no matter what process you find yourself in? Some of you would say yes, and some of you would say, no, I haven't rested well in years, Pastor. David understood what that was like, and that's why I want to talk to you about sleeping like a baby, because some of you use some good sleep like a baby. One of my favorite things to do when my kids were born is watch them sleep. So you say, well, that sounds creepy, but there's just something peaceful about it. If you, if you had not tried it, you should try that. Just watch a baby sleep. You just see no care in the world, complete relaxation, complete dependence, complete trust, and complete restful sleep. I believe, let me have your eyes for a minute. I believe, because some of you couldn't say yes to that question, I believe somebody's leaving this place today 
Maybe it's nap time. Maybe it's tonight, but you are going to get some new, restored, replenished, redeemed rest because of what God has for you in his word today. I believe that with all of my heart. Yes, you're right. I don't know the process you're in, but I know the God we serve. And he's got something for you today. And you know, a lot of times trusting Jesus in a process is really all about perspective. And there's one illustration about having a perspective that really shapes my whole idea of when I go through processes in life. And it was back in 2005, it was the first and I think the only out of country mission trip that Jessica, my wife and I got to go on together. Went to Uruguay and going to Uruguay, we flew on a plane. How many of you don't like flying? That's me. Some of you love it. How many of you can sleep on a plane? Not me. So there I was, some 10-hour flight. Everybody's sleeping around me. Jessica's asleep. And it's, we're flying, you know, across time zones and all, and I'm just sitting there. You know that look. And I look out the window, and, and this amazing sight that I'll never forget. You're going to think I'm painting it too much, but it's true. I saw this huge cloud, because here we were. Dozens of hundreds of thousands of feet, whatever it is, 30 feet, I don't know how far. We're way up there. <laughs> you, fall, you know. See, I don't like flying. I already told you. And there's this cloud. Here's this cloud. And I saw the thunder and the lightning in the cloud. It was a crazy sight, amazing sight. I could see it, and it's just, it looked like a basketball. But I saw it there. And I kid you not, I look up above the cloud, and you see these big fluffy white pillowcase-looking clouds and the sun, the rays of sun just darting through those clouds and a rainbow connecting those clouds. Some of you seen sights like that, but I couldn't help but think. And in that moment, God spoke to me while everyone was asleep, sleeping like a baby around me, and my eyes were wide open. I couldn't sleep. God spoke to me in that moment and said, you know, Kevin, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to be consumed by that dark cloud that looks like a basketball. And all you're going to be able to see when you look around is the thunder and the lightning and the darkness and the pain and the despair and the problems of your life. But you've got to remember in those moments when you can't see anything but darkness, I can steer through those doubts and bring about the rainbows, the rays of sunshine, because I see a bigger picture than you can see. Some of you came today to hear that because a lot of times we just need to fix our perspective. On that trip, I was going to show you a picture of it, but I couldn't find any because that was before the iPhone had changed the course of history. And we use something like this. How many of you remember these bad boys? That is how you had to take selfies in that day and time. And we had a few, and so it would go something like this. I don't even know if I'm going to be in the picture. And now you can't see. I showed my little girl, she's four of this, yesterday. She said, take a picture of me, Daddy. So I took a picture of her, wound it up, took the picture. She walked over beside me. What do you think she said? Let me see, Dad. I said, no can do, sweetheart. You got to get this stuff developed. And you know, I was thinking about how I took pictures on a disposable camera like this in Uruguay in 2005, but then I got to thinking about that experience I had on the plane and how a lot of times when we're in the middle of problems, our perspective gets broken and our perspective compared to God's infinite knowledge, airplane view sometimes is a lot like a disposable camera, this tiny little lens that we get to look through and we can't see all the big picture things that God is stirring, that God has in mind. And I want you to know today that you're going to be able to rest if you sleep and rest in the promises of God, the same God who has an airplane view when at times we only get to look through the tiny little lens of a disposable camera. That's why I believe somebody's sleeping better tonight, because your perspective is going to get tweaked and fixed. You know, I've learned about God that he doesn't promise to guard us from trouble, but he does promise to guide us through it. Some of you have been praying saying, God, just get me out of this mess. But God says, I don't want to do that yet, but I want to guide you through it. I don't want to guard you from it because in and through it, and when I guide you and walk with you through it, I'm going to be doing some things that I could only do in the midst of a storm. Who's ready for Psalm 3 now? David's in the middle of just such a storm. He's in caves. He's fleeing. and We just read about that. Look at Psalm 3. As he fled from his son Absalom, he wrote this in Psalm 3. It's got eight verses. I want us to read those together today. Verse 1. 
David writes, O Lord, how many are my foes? Can I get an amen? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. You have those friends in your life? There's no hope for you. Even God couldn't do anything about your mess. You ever said that about your own situation? Your own self? Well, that's where David was. There's no salvation for him, even in God. Mm. But David says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. We talked about last week, looking up. He's the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. My favorite verse in this passage is one that my dad used to read over me anytime I would be in tough times or when our family was going through a challenging situation. David said, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I want you to read that verse with me. Let's read it aloud. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of the many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. This coming from the guy who's fearing from his life at the hands of his own son. And he said, I lay down and I slept because the Lord sustained me. I've got a couple of thoughts I want to share with you. Two things you can trust when you're in the middle of something. The first one is this. The same grace that got you here will get you there. The same grace that got you here will get you there. I need a couple of people to help me preach this point. I'm serious. You don't have to preach. I'm going to pick on one. I want, I want Mr. Palmer to come join me for a minute. And now I need, a, I need a lady, a volunteer. You don't have to talk. You just have to be able to walk. Any ladies want to volunteer to join me? Come on up, Lindsay. All right. That was a reluctant hand raise, by the way. That's right. Yeah, I'm going to pick harder on you. You are going to represent where I used to be, the old me. The problem, me. (laughs) The one that needs to be redeemed and saved. (laughs) Can you do that well? Yeah. Okay. You, Lindsay, you're going to represent where God's taking me. And so, Jordan, I want you to come with me. Come stand back here. Let's get you in the corner. You ever been in the dark corners of life? All right. Come here, Lindsay. You can come join us here. You know, in verse 2, it says that not even God could make a difference in your life. That's how David felt. That's what David was walking through, the old me. Aren't you glad that there was a moment, if you have met Jesus today, if not, guess what, today can be that day. Aren't you glad that there was a moment where God said, you know what, I see where you are, but I want to walk you somewhere else. The grace that is going to bring you forward is something that you can't earn, but I want to give to you, and he met us there. And here we are, and now I took a step. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. And I love this about David, and what God does with us is this, is we take one little step at a time. So you stand in front of me here, if you will, and when I step, you'll step with me. Because this is what happens. We take one little step, and maybe we stay there for a year. (laughs) But we took one step away from where I used to be. The grace that got me here is going to get me there. And here's what I love about God. He meets us where we are. He meets us here in the dark corners of our life, but he doesn't leave us there, and he starts leading us somewhere. So we step, and we step, and we step, and as we step, he moves ahead of us. As we step, we think, well, why can't I ever just feel like I'm where I want to be? Do you ever feel that way? Why can't I ever just get there? And I want you to know you will get there when you're with him in glory, but until then, I step, he steps in front of me. God has this target where I want to be in my life, and as I step, he moves that target a little further because he brings me forward, and we step together, and we step together, and we step together. We go through the problems of life, and we step together, and it feels frustrating sometimes because I can't ever quite reach where I want to be, but here's what I want you to know. The grace that got you here will get you there, and so many times the encouragement we need to go through the problems of life is to do this. Look how far I've come. 
I used to be here. This is where I was. And I'm not where I want to be, but God has stepped me forward, and the grace that has gotten me here is going to get me there. And we step. Are you getting worried yet? And we step. And we step. You want to keep going? We step. (laughs) The stage isn't big enough, but here's what I want you to do. 1 Samuel 17, just write that down for a minute. As you look at this illustration, the grace, the same grace that got you here is going to get you there. David, in the early stages of his life, way before his son was trying to chase him down and kill him, in 1 Samuel 17, this is the Goliath story. And everybody thought he was crazy when he said, I can get there. I can take that step. I can take down that Philistine giant named Goliath. I can do that. And you know what he said when everybody doubted him? I think about verse 2 that we just read of Psalm 3 where he said, you know, even the Lord can't do anything with you right now. This situation, this problem that you're in, that's what he was being told. That's what was filling his ears, but he wouldn't believe it because he had the same mindset that he had when he said, I'll go after Goliath. And he took that step. He said, I think it's verse 37. He said, the same God, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. He's nothing compared to my God. Here's what he did. He saw where he needed to go and this next step felt impossible, but he turned around and he said, you know what? I've seen the faithfulness of God, the same God who delivered me from that old me, the same God who took me where I was, delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, is going to deliver me from this next step, this Philistine that everybody is afraid of. And in your life, you've got to know the same grace that got you here is going to get you there. I believe that as frustrating as it can be to know I can't quite get that next step, I can't ever feel like I've arrived, I think one of the best remedies for the discouragement in that journey of life that you have comes from just taking a moment, turning around, and remembering the faithfulness of God. There's two big gaps here. There's a gap here. This is a gap that makes you grateful. This is your gratefulness gap. The best remedy for discouragement in your life is to remember the faithfulness of God. This is your gratefulness gap and this is your growth gap to get me from here to where I'm going. When we step, he steps, but he's right beside us. Can we thank these guys? You did great, you did great. I hope that this week that image is going to stick in your head. I hope that this week you're going to be able to pause and just remember the, remember the faithfulness of God and how God created this big gap behind you. Yes, how many of you would say that I'm not, with your left hand, you would say, hey, I'm, I'm not who I was. Raise your left hand if that's you. I'm not who I was. Keep it up. Now how many of you would say, but I'm also not where I want to be. Now do this. Do you want to know how you fill your hands with some good next steps? If you don't, I mean, I can close. You do? Okay. Well, guess what? I got some more for you. So keep your hands open. You can put them away, but keep your heart open because I've got another word for you. Not only is it that the same grace, the same grace that got you here is going to get you there, but get this, the same grace that will get you there is with you here. The same grace that will get you there is also with you right now. Here, look at Psalm 3, verse 5 on the screen with me again. I lay down and slept. I lay down and slept, and I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Some of you need some rest today. You know, in in church, there's one thing I've learned. I'm a church boy, for sure. I grew up in church, proud of my heritage. I love the local church. I believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. We often say the church is the hope of the world. No, if that's the case, we're in trouble. We're pretty hopeless. Jesus is the hope of the world, but the local church is the vehicle that he built and said, go carry my gospel, the good news of Jesus, the hope of the world, to the world that's hopelessly broken. So we get to be a part of that. But you know, in the church world, we often get really consumed, as we should, with the beginning and the end. We'll sing, when we all get to heaven... What a... 
I love that song. I could sing the rest of it, I'll, but I'll spare you. We'll let Chip do that. But, you know, sometimes we think that church is all about the end, and we'll just zoom in there so much that we think that our faith doesn't meet us here. We think that it's about how it started, that conversion. I got my fire insurance. I don't have to spend eternity in hell because I know Jesus. I get to spend eternity in heaven now because I do know him, but here I am in the middle. Somebody say, I am here. How many of you have learned that here hurts? Here often hurts. And that's why I want to spend a minute because David got this when he wrote, I lay down and slept and I woke again for the Lord sustained me. David understood. David understood in the depths of his soul that the grace that got him here would get him there. But he also understood that the grace that's going to carry him there is with him right here in the now, in this moment, with whatever it is that caused you to raise your hands earlier. He is there and he will meet you and you can have rest in those very moments. Look at this picture. Hopefully you won't see one of these for a while. I'll have to worry with this. But you ever seen one of these? We're all going to see our life end one way or another here on earth. Eternity is coming. Like it or not. We don't know the dates that will go on our tombstones. But here we are. You see the dash in the middle? That's where we are. I want you to know that the same grace that's going to fill in the ends and the beginning blanks of your life is with you in the dash. And so my challenge to you is let's live in the dash like David did with the understanding that David has because here often hurts. And, you know, I've thought about God and we talk about God's promises and we should. And we should sing when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be because that gives us hope in the now. That gives us hope here in this moment but I want you to think about this. God is a God of promises. Can I get an amen? God is a God of promises, but God is also a God of the process. God doesn't just say, here are my promises. Go out and try to get there. Figure it out on your own. God says, here are my promises. Live in them in the middle of the process, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you in the middle of the process as you pursue my promises. I'm glad that that's the God that we serve I love that when God is described in the Old Testament, it says God is the great I am. He's the great I am. It didn't say God is the great I was. He didn't say I am the great I will be. He said I am the great I am. I'm with you in the process and those promises that I have for your life will carry you through in the middle of your dash as you follow and seek after me. Jot down John chapter 14. This is a great passage. Don't turn there. Just jot it down. Maybe you look at it this week. John 14, one of my favorite passages to talk about when I'm doing a funeral, but it's a great thing to talk about when I'm doing a message about the dash, when we talk about living right now, because this, this is a familiar passage perhaps to you where Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. In my, how, in my father's house are many mansions, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Later on, he says, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But one of the things we miss in that passage a lot of times is that you're in it, that I'm in it. You know this guy called Doubting Thomas? If you don't know about him, he had a lot of doubts. He got the nickname for a reason. That's why I say you're in the passage and I'm in the passage. Because we have questions. We see the certainty of the red letters, the words of Jesus. Yet he's there saying, but Father, but Jesus, we don't know how to get there. How do we know? We're not going to know. We don't know how to get there. Right? Because we're in the process. We're living in the dash. And we don't realize a lot of times that the same grace that we believe in to get us there is also with us here. That's when Jesus said. That's the context through which Jesus delivered those words where he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You get to the Father through me and through me alone. And I love this about Jesus, only Jesus. Think about this. Let this roll around your brain this week when it comes to your dash, your here, your now. Only Jesus can be steps ahead of you. I go to prepare a place for you, he said. Steps ahead of you, yet in step with you at the same time. Only Jesus can be steps ahead of you, yet in step with you at the same time. He's preparing a place for you, but he's walking 
right beside you. And if you're in the middle today of a change, a transition, a storm, a fire, a process, stay focused in the middle when you're taking those steps. Remember the faithfulness of God, where God's brought you from. And I want you to know today, I want you to hear me. My heart breaks for somebody that's here today that feels like God's abandoned you in the process. He's, yes, a God of promises, but he's the God of your processes, and he's right in step with you, even though he steps ahead of you. The same grace that made that gap behind you will help you fill the gap that's in front of you. The same grace that did that is also going to do this. The same grace that entered the darkness is bigger than your doubts. The same grace that overcame that darkness is bigger than your dash, is with you in your dash. The same grace that secures my future today will sustain me in the fire that I find myself in. The same grace, the same grace that bought your salvation is going to bring you some sleep. The same grace that got you redemption is going to give you rest in the middle of the process that you find yourself in. Paul said it this way. Philippians 1, verse 6, Paul said, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Look at me for a minute. Some of you think the here and the now, the dash, the process, that you find it hard to trust God in, that God stepped aside somehow and said, Go figure it out. I want you to know today that God's not finished with you. God sent me here today to look you in the eye and tell you that he's with you in the process, that yes, he's got promises, he's the God of all promises, but he's the God of your process, and he's not finished with you, and even if nobody else believes in you, Psalm 3, verse 2, even God can't get you out of this one, David, even if nobody else believes in you, God looks at you, yes, you, yes, that mess, yes, that process, yes, those things that feel so dark, and God says, not only am I not finished with you yet, but I love you and I believe in you. Will you believe it today? Will you let God be the God of your process? Will you be able to lay down and sleep and wake again because God's going to sustain you? You know, a lot of times we try to go around our problems, don't we? And just a couple of weeks ago, we have some potholes in our driveway, and it's been raining off and on here in Indiana. And so we were riding bikes and walking, and I was stepping all around the puddles. And I was showing my kids, you know, like, we already got the bath today, and, you know, I, we don't want to get in trouble with mom, so go around the puddles, right? And so I went inside for a minute. You see where this is going, right? <laughs> Dad 101 fail right there, right? And so I look out the window, and Jessica and I see, what do you think the kids are doing? They're in the middle of the puddles, man. They are just all in it. They're jumping in, you know. They're just hopping in the puddles. They went straight through the middle. And as I was thinking this week, that sometimes, you know, Jesus often said, let the little children come to me because of such is the kingdom of God. Don't keep those kids away from me because if you can't become like one of these little ones, you'll never enter my kingdom. I think that we can learn something from those kids. And in this process, I want to challenge you, stop trying to sidestep the process and sneak away around the process that God has you in and just jump in the middle of the puddle and trust that God's hands will sustain you and you'll be able to look just as David did and say, I lay down and slept because the Lord has sustained me. Maybe it's time you jump into a puddle with both feet this week and stop trying to sidestep what God is trying to save you and do some amazing things in and through you. Sometimes God doesn't want to get you out of what you're in so that he can get in the middle with you. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes God doesn't want to get you out of what you're in because he wants to show up in the middle of it with you. Think about the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of you sang songs about him as a kid? Some of you don't even know who he is, who those crazy names, where did they come up with those names anyway? Well, for their faith, they were thrown into a fiery furnace, and God didn't get them out of the furnace. There were three of them, but they looked over, and what did they see? There was a fourth. Because God didn't get them out of the fiery furnace, he got in there with them. Maybe it's time to do some puddle jumping this week. Stop sidestepping and let God work in the middle. Last thing I want to give you today is this, just a challenge, a charge for you this week. Stop running from what you want God to save you from and start running toward what God saved you for. 
Stop running from what you want God to get you out of and save you from and run straight into the puddle. If you are where you are, you are here. Here's the big red pen showing where you sit in this moment. God may not want you out of that, but start looking for what God saved you for in the midst of that. God didn't just save you so that you could spend eternity with him in heaven. That's not where God, God's bigger than that. Does that apply? And when we get saved, we trust Jesus. Do we have an eternal home in heaven that no one can take from us? You better believe it. But when we have that hope in the middle, in the dash, God meets us there. And he says, I saved you and I want to give you life. I came to give you life and life more abundantly because it applies now in the middle of the fiery furnace, in the middle of the process that you find yourself in today. Is it time to get a new perspective Is it time to put away the disposable camera and start looking for the airplane view that God has, even though you can't see it yet? I want to challenge you to look for God in the process this week, to lay down and sleep and wake again because he's going to sustain you. And the best way to rest in God's promises is just to trust him in the dash, in the here, in the now. Trust him in the process. Just bow your heads with me for just a minute and reflect on what that means for you. Close your eyes. Nobody looking around. I want to speak to some of you that are here today that you've trusted God for your salvation, but you need to trust God with your process. How many of you would say right now that I've trusted Jesus for my Savior, but I'm in the middle of a process right now, and I need God to show up in it? Would you lift your hands? Lift it high. Praise God. Hands all over the building. Put your hands down. How many of you would say that maybe today, and I don't want you to raise your hand just yet, but I want you to answer this question. Maybe you would say today is the day that I need to trust God with the process of saving me. I need to trust Jesus as my way, like he said in John 14. You would say, if I were to die today, Pastor, I don't know that I would spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. I'd like to know, but I just don't. I think I do, but there's still a little bit of a question mark. If that's you, I've got great news for you. I can't save you. No one here can save you. But Jesus already paid the price to be able to save you. And he wants to meet you right there in the middle of wherever you sit. So many times we'll say, God, i got to get some things cleaned up first. got to get my life in order, and then I'll take that step, God. But when I do, God, I'll take that step. I promise I will. And my challenge to you is if you wait on you to be ready, that day's never going to come. Take that leap of faith today. That's the beauty of the gospel is God meets you in the middle. Nobody looking around. I want you to think about the cross of Jesus. There were three crosses. Where was his? It was in the middle. And salvation is all about letting him be in the middle and you moving over to the side. Just like that thief on the other cross where Jesus looked at him and said, This day you'll be with me in paradise. Yes, you're as bad as the thief. Yes, I'm as bad as the thief. But all it takes to be saved and spend eternity with him forever, that grace that's going to get us there and that's going to change us here, is for me to say, Jesus, the middle is yours, the throne is yours. Jesus said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What does that mean for me? It means you've got to believe Jesus died for you, paying a price for your sin that you could never pay. He lived that sinless life that you or I could never live. You've got to believe he died and paid that price. You've got to believe that he rose again. But that's not enough. You know, the demons, the devil himself believe. They know. But it's about a trust, trusting God with that process, saying, God, I've been trying to save myself, but I realize I'm not good enough. I need grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, because if it was of works, if it was something I could do, then I would boast about it. But God says, I want to meet you in your process, right in the middle of your mess, and I want to save you. And if you cry out to Jesus with your words, you say, well, I can't say it like you. God doesn't want you to say it like I said it. He wants you to cry out from your heart to his and ask him to save you. And he will meet you right where you are. Whether you're watching us online, whether you're in this room, pause. Nothing else matters. Will you trust him as your savior? I'm not going to lead you in a prayer because your heart's already screaming it. Would you just take a minute right now where you sit, whatever mess you're in, Cry out to Jesus, ask him to save you, and he will do just that. Will you do it right now?
somebody's here and eternity looks a lot different for you right now. Nobody looking around. I don't you know. No one's going to take you out of the building. We're not going to take you anywhere. I just want to pray for you if you took that step today. If you would say, today is the day of my salvation. I gave my heart. I gave my life to Jesus, asking him to save me. I nailed that down in this place today. I want to ask you, nobody's looking around. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor? Today's the day of my salvation. I see you in the back. Praise God. Three, four of you there. Lift your hands. Lift them high. I see you. God bless you. Who else? Wave me down. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Who else? You can put your hands down. Anyone else? Say, pray for me. Today's that day. Thank you, Lord. God, thank you. Thank you for grace. Thank you for what faith can mean and look like in our life, God, when we're so messed up. When we have so much sin, we have nothing to offer. We're like David there in verse 2 where everyone's just telling us, even God can't do anything in your mess. But you swoop down, you get on your knees, you come to us, you come down to our level, and you bring your grace, and you bring all of it to us, and you save us, and you meet us there, God. We don't deserve that, but you're such a free giver of life. Thank you for that. Thank you for these at least four or five in the room who said today is that day, God, where I have given my heart, my life to Jesus. Let us be the church, God, around these people. We're not just called to go to church. We're called to be the church together. And thank you for adding to your family in this place. God, I pray for those who lifted their hand and said they're in the middle of a process. Meet them in that process, God. Show yourself real. Show yourself true. Show yourself trustworthy in that process. Guide them through that process, even if you can't guard them from it. God, I pray we would lay down and sleep and wake again this week because you have sustained us and that we could truly know what it's like to sleep like a baby, to sleep with full dependence and trust this week. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in this place. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the psalms, the songs of Jesus. And thank you for these you've added to your family in this place today. And all God's people said, amen. Let's welcome these to the family of God. Celebrate loudly with me today.